Hi, Teardown time again. Um, now this is a fairly new um, piece of test equipment. This is a Rigol DG4062 function generator, an arbitrary waveform generator. Um, first thing you notice about it is as soon as you pick it up, it is really, really heavy. I mean, you're used to kit with switch mode power supplies, LCD screens, and plastic cases, be light. I mean, this has really got some weight to it, so um, let's find out what's in it. Well, this looks like where a lot of the weights come from. There's a quite a thick metal um, metal cover around the hole inside, much thicker than you see on a lot of other kit, which tends to use like tin plate for shielding. Um, I'm guessing this is probably a combination of shielding and structure, but I suspect this is where quite a lot of the weight is. Right, so you can see this back frame has got the power supply and the fan built in and just a single connector down to the uh, main PCB. Right, on the first look this looks like a very nicely made board, very good um, soldering quality, nicely laid out. Can't see any obvious sides of any bodge wires, that looks very impressive. Let's take a closer look. Right, let's take a close look at this main board. We'll um, start off with the power supply in, which is good a, pl good a place as any to start. We've got a bunch of these linear regulators. These are obviously going to be to provide the analog, uh, the power supply for the analog output stage. There's plus minus 5 and plus minus 15 there. Um, one thing I've noticed on this board is um, all the parts are very well known makes. There's analog devices, linear tech, even these capacitors, these are Epcos. There's no weird, obscure Chinese stuff that you've never heard of anywhere. So, yeah, component choice is obviously good quality, obviously assuming they're genuine and not fake. Yeah, even something as trivial as a voltage regulator, they're using sort of brand name stuff rather than obscure stuff. These will be the switch mode regulators for the digital supply, and again, here we've got linear tech switch mode controller. A few more, there's quite a few power supply rails. Notice that. Um, there's quite a lot of labelled test points around here showing all the various voltages, which is nice. Uh, we've got the beeper up here. This here, this is an Actel A3P03. This is a flash uh, FPGA. And there's the JT connector for it over here. There's a connector here that says SPI underscore boot. Maybe to connect an SPI flash device to boot one of the processors or something. Next to it here is... Um, Cypress USB interface chip, so this is going to be providing the um, USB functionality and that will next to the USB connector. A um, couple of clock generators here, these are just HCO4 uh, inverters with crystals. Uh, Ethernet connector here, this is um, the Ethernet interface chip KSZ8051 uh, by Micro, that's the, an Ethernet uh, transceiver. There's a large flash ROM here, this is going to have all the program code I'd imagine and also probably the FPGA code, just a couple of buffers here. Um, this is the main process here, this is an analog devices, um, black fin device, ADSP BF526. So that's going to be you providing user interface, but also all the um, actual generation of all the waveforms in the memory. Um, it's interesting they use that rather than using, say, a D, uh, an FPGA that's got DSP on it. Um, one reason for that is that FPGA uh, silicon space is quite expensive, so that's why a lot of manufacturers are moving away from this idea of integrating, producing a soft core pr uh, processor on the FPGA just because it's quite expensive, and they're now moving to put things like hard arm cores and so on on. Down here, there's a bit of a, uh, this will be the SRAM for the um, DSP. There's a blank flash footprint here, which presumably is for the um, DSP. I'm not using over here. We've got um, what's I'm certain it will be an FPGA. Um, there's some 512 meg DDR2 RAM here, which will be the main um, data, yeah, memory for the actual waveform data. A little heat sink uh, stuck to the FPGA. Just above it, this is actually a fast AC. This is actually the same A to D they use in the DS1052 scopes, 100 mega sample per second A to D, which I'm not quite sure why they need a fast A to D on this thing, to be honest. Um, I wouldn't have thought they'd use it for the frequency counter function, so um, a bit puzzled by that. 
Um, here's the D2A converter. Now they've done this pathetic, they haven't actually scrubbed the, the number off, they've actually lasered the number off. Just to show you how ridiculous and pathetic that is. It took me about 30 seconds to find what this is on the net. Um, all I did was I just searched for dual 500 mega sample per second uh, DAC and I came up with the uh, analog devices AD978 series. There's an I7801 and 3 for 12, 14 and 16 bits. Uh, it's got the same number of pins, the same package. If you look on the data sheet, the power supply pins, it shows pins 1 and 6 are on the power supplies. Um, these two pins are another power supply in these, so that, yeah, the footprint's an exact match, so it, there's no real question that it is that chip. So, and that just goes to show what a total waste of time it is lasering chips like that off. It's not at all hard for anybody to find, to find so it um, really is pretty pointless. Uh, there's a few other odds and ends. There's quite a lot. All this stuff on on here. This is filtering for the uh, output of the D2A. So this would be the uh, to turn basically a sequence of digital samples into an analog, analog waveform. So this would be the, the, the first uh, first level of analog filter. And there's quite a lot. About sort of four or five stages of inductor and capacitor filtering on there. So that's a fairly um, complex filter on the output of there. And there's a few odd sort of op amps and analog multiplexers and so on surrounding it. And down here this is the output stage so this will basically be an output amplifier. There's a relay switched attenuators here. Um, I've pulled the heatsink off one of the channels here and again they've lasered off the chips but these are just going to be buffer, sort of 50 ohm buffer chips. Again it, sh it really shouldn't be too hard to figure out what those are. Um, they seem to like analog devices so AD will probably be the first place to start looking. Um, I can't really be bothered to look in detail, but I really don't think it would be too hard to figure out what those are. And um, we've got these are the rear sockets, like this little uh, design in China with little fish with bubbles coming out of its mouth. Cute. Um, version 1.01, 1 .01, uh, September 2011, so it's fairly recent. Looks like probably one minor revision. Most of the stuff up here, this is going to be the interfacing for the rear sockets. There'll be probably relays to select which uh, some of these have got, have got multiple functions. Interestingly up here, there's a thing called X-Lock. There's actually a LED which I'm guessing lights up when it, it sees the external 10 MHz reference signal being applied. Because if you select it on the front panel, it does say, you know, if there's nothing applied, it will tell you there's nothing there. But it's interesting there's actually a LED on the board, which you can't see. I mean, there's no path to the outside world for that. And the rest of this is just going to be a little analog op amp. There's a load of HC595s. These will be producing all the parallel uh, control lines to control the relays, the analog multiplexers, just all the digital selection and so on on the um, the output stage. Down here this is the uh, obviously the flex from the LCD and down here there's an analog device, ADF 4360 frequency synthesizer. Uh, overall this is a yeah, very nice build quality, you know you wouldn't really see any difference in something from a yeah, a well-known name, Agilent Tech. Pretty much the only difference, really, is that Agilent, you'll, you'll find some custom chips, but other than that, the overall build standard choice of components is very much the same as you'd find on you know, top quality gear, so I'm very impressed with something that's come out of China. You know, you, you, apart from the fact that it says design in China, you could look at this board and really not know that it was from the Chinese manufacturer as opposed to uh, one of the more established brands. It's a uh, very impressive build quality. Literally about the only thing I can find on this board that shows any trace of being a mod or anything is there's a little bit of flux around these two resistors. So I'm guessing they they may have been replaced with a different value or possibly just reworked from a, a poor reflow. Looking at the top of this board it looks very very good, especially for a product that's fairly new. One interesting little detail here, these resistors are marked version. Um, I'd be interested to know whether these are actually connected and machine readable or um, because you do occasionally find, yeah, because resistors cost almost nothing, you do occasionally actually find them being used as markers on the board so that they can tell what version of the build it is, you know, that, uh, as well as having you know, different component va variants. There's a few resistors that uh, are used as a marker so you can look at the board and tell, tell which build version it is. It may be possible for those to be sensed uh, and at least displayed. But um... Another nice little detail I just noticed as I'm taking the screws out. There's actually two different lengths of screw used um, to hold this board and the front chassis together. And they actually mark on the board. There's a little picture of a little screw there and a long screw there to tell you which ones are the long and the short screws when you put it back together again. It's very nice of them. Right, the whole front comes off as a sort of sub chassis again with this really thick steel structure around it. Um, this is just the front panel with a standard rubber membrane keyboard, nice sort of brass screw inserts in there. And so here we've got the keyboard PCB, knob encoder, obviously the BNCs go straight through to the PCB. 
um, that's the power switch and everything's nicely screwed together onto that chassis. Now here's the back side of the PCB as I was expecting there's really not much on it because there was yeah there wasn't really much left after what we saw on the front on the top side. It's mostly just decoupling capacitors, a couple of eight CMOS chips for multiplexing and uh, some couple of more five five nine fives for IO control. Really nothing of any significance. There's a few blank areas here of the gold, with gold plating and these are to make contact with these spring clips for EMC shielding. There's a sort of spring clip there. Um, there's another one down here on this front panel, so that, that's all quite nice and solid. I do quite like these funky great big long reach BNCs, I've never seen those before. And this is the back side of the keyboard um, PCB, there's really nothing on it. There's a lattice CPLD and it's programming connector and that is it, nothing else at all on there. Again there's some shielding contacts on the board, so a little um, rotary encoder, obviously there's some LEDs in the middle of the buttons. And we can see from the layer markings here, this is a six layer board, which is about what I was expecting. Because they're using BGA chips, you really need that many layers just to break, break the pins out from the, uh, in particular from the FPGA. Tiny detail I just noticed on the LCD flex. Um, these two labels, OTP WEN and OTP VDD. Um, a lot of these LCD modules, because the actual LCD material itself has sort of some variation in production, the controller chips quite often have some one-time programmable memory in them to control the things like the contrast and all that uh, colour balance and all that sort of stuff. So I've noticed that a few times reading the data sheets so actually, although most of the settings you can actually set via the I2C, these have got SDN and SDL lines which mostly set up the voltages and in some case the timings. And they've often also got a one-time programmable memory to actually nail the correct settings in for each display so that you can just load it up with standard parameters and it's always going to look right throughout the different production variations because it's been loaded from that OTP memory. Um, that might provide an interesting avenue if you wanted to have some really obscure security in your product to actually store a little bit of information in the OTP memory on the LCD which might confuse the hell out of someone trying to do naughty things with it. I've just fired up and you, I've connected an external clock reference and you can see that LED near the power connector lit up. If I disconnect it, it'll probably Turn off, yeah, that turns off. So that's just showing that it's seeing some external clock, and there's also a power LED there. I'm not really quite sure they bother putting those LEDs on there, so they're handy for debugging. Right, let's take a look at the back of the unit and the power supply. Um, main comes in on an IC socket, and the connections in there, as well as being fairly well protected by this, they're also heat shrunk. The fan in there, and this thing, I'm not really sure it actually gets warm enough to need the fan. Um, I had it running for a few hours and I really couldn't detect any warmth at all coming out of it. I've used one of these sort of stick down cable clips and these things do tend to fall off over time but that cable's not going to do any damage or go anywhere if it does so I'm not particularly concerned about that. Right as expected the power supply looks um, pretty nice it's actually got Regon on it so maybe it is actually made by them rather than bought in. It looked like a sort of standalone power supply it's actually it was a board in a board with a, just a separate cover on it. Nicely made proper fiberglass PCB there's all this resin on it for holding components down it looks like a bit of a bodge but it's very common it means that you know, heavy components aren't going to fall off the board um, so that it doesn't look particularly pretty it me you know it shows they there is actually some care gone into it pretty up-to-date modern design here we've got there's a standby supply here this is a separate su standby supply using um, chip that's designed for things like phone chargers for to provide very low standby power because this doesn't have a proper mains on off switch it's got a soft on off switch but it looks like they've gone to some care to sort of make sure it doesn't draw too much power and standby so that, that's our auxiliary supply this is our main supply and um, this is actually both of the power supply controlled chips are from NXP. Again, you know, a distinct lack of any Chinese components in here. The um, like the output rectifiers, those are on semiconductor. The electrolytics are Epcos. So yeah, throughout this whole thing, you know, decent quality components. It's almost like they're actually deliberately avoiding using Chinese parts, even for like relatively yeah routine parts like output rectifiers and so on. But so the overall layout looks nice. You've got sort of nice little details like sort of some star ground detail here. So they've done a decent job on the layout. Um, there's like slots and cuts to improve creepage distances here. Decent clearance, decent clearance like to, from the primary to the secondary. I don't like the fact they've put a label in this area though. Um, okay, it's 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 not like it, it's sort of plasticky label, but it's not ideal. 
Um, I don't think there's any serious risk. I think that's just a really a very minor quibble. But other than that, I, I you know I, I can't really fault this at all. Um, there does seem to be quite a lot of connections to this. Um, it looks like there's actually a sense back it sends input back from the main supply. I'm not sure whether the main supply and this is likely to be 5 or 3.3 volts but obviously there'll be supplies for those uh, linear rails. Um, one thing you don't often see actually is quite a few of these pads are actually labelled in Chinese um, which you very rarely see on PCBs. Um, maybe someone viewing can give us some translations of these symbols. So there's just a few Chinese labels on the uh, these other leads, and there's a connector there for the fan. Build quality of this is as good as the rest of the, uh, the rest of the unit. Absolutely happy with that. And this casing is probably the, the sort of strongest, toughest thing I've seen in any any bit of test equipment sort of built in the last ten or fifteen years. It's um, it's all riveted together, so yeah, the, it's, it's about one mil thick steel to start with, but it's been sort of riveted into these sort of square sections. So I mean, if you drop this thing, I'm sure the casing might disintegrate, but the thing's going to carry on working. I guarantee it. It's just so well protected. Um, it's obviously going to be very well shielded. Um, they've got this EMI filter on the uh, power, so they're obviously serious about. Um, getting all their EMC results to actually be genuine rather than the usual Chinese fakery. Uh, one thing I did notice I was a little bit surprised at is that the approval marks, it's got TUV and a C mark, but there's no FCC marks on here. Maybe it's just that they haven't got the um, gone through the process yet. It may just be it, it takes time to actually get those approvals. But I've no doubt that you know they wouldn't have any problem, problem at all getting all, all certifications based on the build quality it looks absolutely fine oh one other thing I just forgot to mention on the power supply is it does actually even have power factor correction as well so they're you know that they spend far more on the power supply than they strictly needed to um, to produce something that's going to comply with all the all the emissions limit you know that they really have done a good job on this well, let's take a quick look at the uh, the power drawer it's got this sort of stupid apple throbby lead thing that it does when it's uh, in standby mode um, standby, not sure how accurate this thing is at low power consumption, but it's showing about 14.1 watts, maybe a little bit on the high side. And looking at the actual current, you can see it's actually pulsing, so it's obviously operating in some sort of discontinuous mode, sort of flipping between about sort of 50 odd milliamps up to about 90 odd milliamps on occasion. And just turn it on. And it goes up to about uh, a little under 30 watts, which is fairly reasonable. That's with the backlight on fairly low. Just turn the backlight up, see if that increases significantly. Tiny bit, up to about slightly over 30 watts with the backlight on full. So, I mean, I can only say I'm very impressed. The build quality of this is as good as you would find in anything from Tektronix, Agilent, Hamag, TTI, all of the well-known brands in you know, anything below, you know, a couple of grand. Um, the build quality is as good. The component quality, they've clearly used decent quality components, even when they didn't need to. I'm, I'll, do, I'll be doing a full review. I've only had a very quick play with this, but, yeah, functionally it's looking pretty good. Um, certainly streets ahead of your average um, Chinese junk software, it, a few minor quirks, but I've yet to find anything of any seriousness. But in terms of hardware build quality, I, I just really cannot find any fault with it at all. Very good, very impressed. Regal do seem to be moving into some more high-end high -end instruments, and you know, with this sort of build quality and the pricing, I think Agilent and Tech should really start worrying. Pretty much the only difference is, gonna, is really brand perception and maybe product support. In terms of actual hardware build quality, yeah, this is as good as anything you'll buy from Tektronix or Agilent, LaCroix, all the big names. No question about that.